All right, good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us tonight to learn all about our fascinating frogs and reptiles. Um, our, our guest this evening, um, Warren Schmidt, um, is going to tell us all about South Africa's fascinating frogs and reptiles and how they are faring in the face of environmental pollution, climate change, and habitat loss. Um, we were just discussing before we started how this is affecting many things besides frogs and reptiles, but uh, that's what Warren specializes in. So he's going to tell us all about it. Warren has over three decades of practical experience in the fields of herpetology, conservation, biology, invasion science, and ecology. He holds a master's degree in ecological science from the University of KwaZulu-Natal, and his research interests include the distribution and conservation of Africa's reptiles and amphibians. He is also a director at Biodiversity and Environment Africa. So, Warren, welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening and giving us your, your valuable time. Um, and I will hand over to you. Right, good evening. Um, warm welcome to everybody that's joining us this evening. My name is Warren Schmidt, and for the better part of 35 years, I have been absolutely fascinated by reptiles, amphibians, and particularly snakes. My interest in snakes developed when I was still in high school. And I took every moment, every weekend, um, took the opportunity to get out there, run around in the felt and, and see what I could find in that. And in the early days, it was just fun and games, just going out there, enjoying the environment and seeing what we could find. Um, the thrill of finding a new species of snake or something that I hadn't seen before. And I never really gave conservation much of a thought at the time. But a lot of the areas where I used to run around looking for reptiles over the last uh, 20 to 30 years, they've all been developed. And I kept records in the early days. And so I was started to monitor what used to occur in these areas and how they survive with development, which species survive, which species are wiped out. And over the years, it becomes more and more alarming when you see um, what's happening to not only our amphibians and reptiles, but biodiversity in general. Now, we know the, the situation with frogs, amphibians, over the, in the early 1990s, a lot of scientists across the world started noticing alarming declines in amphibian populations, uh, where even in protected areas, and a very good example in the Monteverde cloud forest in Costa Rica, there was uh, the golden toad, which used to spawn and uh, come out in their thousands in a very well-protected area. And within a few years, those toads had all but vanished. And scientists around the world started looking in different areas, in South America, the tropics, Africa, Europe, Australia, Asia. And they all started coming to the same conclusion. There is something very, very wrong out there in the environment. Amphibians and reptiles, and particularly the frogs, were just vanishing. And there's a number of causes. Um, over the years, with intense research, they found that climate change has played a part, uh, disease, especially the chytrid fungus, which um, is a fungus that affects frogs, has had a dramatic effect and has caused the extinction of, of uh, several dozen species across the world, environmental pollution and that. So tonight I'm going to look at the future of South Africa's frogs and reptiles from South Africa's perspective and how are our reptiles and amphibians faring up and are they protected in our national parks and protected areas? How much protection? Are they getting? Now, before I jump into that, what on earth is herpetology? You may have heard the term herpetology, herpetologist. So the world of herpetology, it's the academic study of amphibians and reptiles. And you may ask the question, why are amphibians and reptiles clumped together? Because they are two completely different vertebrate groups. And in actual fact, reptiles are not all closely related. Um, tortoises are not related closely to crocodiles, even though they're ectothermic, they're cold-blooded, and they have scales. They are, in actual fact, quite different animals. 
Now, this stems back going right into the 17th century with uh, uh, early naturalists like Linnaeus or Carl von Linn, who was the father of modern taxonomy. He created the binomial system of classification for plants and animals. And right back then, these early naturalists looked at reptiles and amphibians as and I quote, foul and loathsome creatures that dwell in smelly swamps. And the perception that herpetologists have today is that we kind of do the same, that we, we dwell in these uh, very decrepit swampy areas looking for reptiles. And of course, snakes have this reputation of crawling on their bellies. And um, many of them are are highly venomous, so um, they can cause serious snake bites and even fatalities. So over the years, frogs and reptiles and snakes have really received a bad rap. But hopefully by the end of tonight, um, uh, I'm sure most of you are conservation minded and you do see them in a better light than what the early naturalists looked at. But hopefully you'll get an appreciation of just the spectacular diversity of our amphibians and reptiles that we have um, globally, but also especially here in Southern Africa. So herpetology is the academic study of amphibians and reptiles, and it includes uh, frogs, toads, chelonians, the tortoises, the crocodilians, uh, the tutora from New Zealand, and the squamate reptiles. Amphibians include the frogs and the toads, the newts and the salamanders, and the worm-like Sicilians. Now, in South Africa, we only have frogs and toads. Further north in North Africa, in Europe, and the Americas, and Asia, you get newts and salamanders, which are amphibians, but uh, they've obviously got uh, the caudal appendage, the tail. They actually really look like uh, uh, overgrown tadpoles with limbs. And then you get the Sicilians, which are a very interesting group of earthworm-like looking amphibians that live in damp soil, um, in the tropics. And the closest we get them to South Africa is in Mozambique and Malawi. And there are even several Sicilian species on the Seychelles Islands in the Indian Ocean, which biogeographically is quite fascinating. And it just shows how the Seychelles at one time, in geological time, was connected to mainland Africa. With regards to our reptiles, um, Crocodiles and birds are in actual fact more closely related than crocodiles are to any of the other reptile groups. And from an evolutionary perspective, although ornithologists will uh, throw a cold bucket of ice over me when we mention this, but birds are in actual fact feathered reptiles. Um, they, they're endothermic, they control their body heat, but they are really reptiles. And if you look at the behavior of crocodiles and birds in the parental care the egg laying habitats, there's a lot of similarities. Of course, the one group is covered in feathers and the other group is covered in hard bony scales. But both groups are derived from the ancient archosaurs. Then you have the very unique tuatara, and I'll show you what a tuatara looks like in a moment. It's kind of iguana-like. It's the last remnant or living survivor of an ancient lineage of Sphenodontians. And they are only found in New Zealand. Then you've got your Chelonians, which include the tortoises, the terrapins, and the turtles. Those names are interchangeable depending where you are in the world, in Europe and parts of America. A lot of people refer to tortoises as turtles. But here in South Africa, our tortoises are pretty much the land or the terrestrial dwelling species. The terrapins are the ones the, that live in aquatic freshwater systems. And the turtles are usually what we refer to as our marine turtles. Many of them are seriously threatened. And then lastly, the squamate reptiles, which includes all the lizards and snakes. And snakes as well are pretty much um, a, a, a group derived from lizards. Um, they are in actual fact, technically lizards without limbs. But for the sake of simplicity, we like to still separate lizards and snakes because, I mean, snakes, some species are medically important. So there you've got the Tuatara, New Zealand's bizarre Tuatara, Sphenodon punctatus. Um, at one time, there were thought to be two species, but there's, there's in actual fact only one. 
They have been, um, the, the, since early man, colonized the New Zealand islands um, a couple of hundred years ago and introduced feral animals like uh, pigs and cats and other domestic animals. The Tuatara on the mainland of the North Island and South Island of New Zealand was pretty much wiped out. So the only surviving uh, um, uh, individuals were on offshore islands where invasive species never got to. And thankfully, because if you take a look at this, um, what it looks like a lizard, but anatomically, um, if you look at the skeleton, the cranial system, a lot of the physiology, and even just the skin texture in that is very different from our modern day lizards, even things like the iguanas, which they superficially resemble. The mode of reproduction is very different as well, more related or uh, um, more allied to the reproductive system of birds. And these reptiles can actually withstand extremely cold temperatures. Um, uh, various parts of New Zealand do get quite cold, especially over winter, and they still move around. They are predominantly nocturnal, coming out at night, where they feed on uh, giant crickets called wheater and other small um, invertebrates. So that's the Tuatara, and it's very much the closest we get to a living dinosaur in our extant reptiles today. And then in South Africa, all the other groups are represented in Southern Africa or South Africa. And in terms of our diversity, when it comes to our frogs, we've got approximately 141 species. And I say approximately because we're still describing new species, even at the very moment. And South Africa historically has been very well covered by taxonomists, herpetologists, zoologists, scientists. So we really do have quite a good grasp on our reptile and amphibian diversity, yet we are still describing new species, which is quite fascinating. There are 24 Chelonians or tortoises, terrapins and turtles. Unfortunately, some of them are threatened, some of them are critically endangered. And we've got the Nile crocodile, um, one of several species now in Africa. In Central Africa, there's a couple of dwarf crocodiles, and the Nile crocodile was recently split into two different species. There's a West African form and the Nile crocodile that we have here in South Africa that extends right away from the northern parts of South Africa across East Africa and historically occurred across the Nile River system in North Africa and Egypt. In terms of our lizard diversity, an exceptional species, and many of them are unique to South Africa. They are endemic to South Africa and found nowhere else on the globe. And there are approximately 272 species. And then we've got about 132 different types of snakes. And for those who have a phobia of snakes, you'll be pleased to know that the majority of our snake species are completely harmless. Now, what brings about this incredible diversity of reptile and amphibian fauna at the southern tip of Africa? We are very blessed and fortunate to have a really unique landscape, unique biomes, and uh, quite a, a, a unique or a varied uh, topography and geology as well. We've got some of the ancient, the, the, the most ancient geology in the world, especially in the Barberton area, um, in Pumalanga escarpment and that. But ranging right up from the KwaZulu-Natal in Musu to Drakensberg, high altitude grasslands, down to our messy grasslands, we've got savannas in the north, dry arid savanna of the Kalahari in the west, and of course the low felt region, with the world famous Kruger National Park in the east. The subtropical Indian Ocean coastal belt with the warm uh, ocean current coming down um, gives it a subtropical feel. And as a result of that, we get uh, a lot of tropical species like the gaboon adder and the green mumbas that come down our KwaZulu Natal coast and a lot of other tropical species and tropical frogs. And then probably one of the most unique features of the southern tip of Africa is the Fainbos. Um, succulent Karoo and Albany thicket biomes. Now, particularly the Fainbos has 
numerous endemic species. Unfortunately, due to landscape change, a lot of them are endangered or critically endangered. But that is a very unique biome. And I mean, we don't have to go into the, the, just the sheer floral diversity, the, the botanical, it's a botanical wonderland. But also, too, there are a lot of endemic species that have evolved um, in the Cape Fold Mountains and in, in, in these unique habitats. So we are very fortunate, and that's why our species diversity is incredibly high. So jumping into a few examples of uh, uh, species that really stand out, and I call these the giants, the giants, they're representative giants of our amphibians and reptiles. Um, the one that you're looking over here, or the one that's looking at you at the moment, is the giant bullfrog. It's pretty widespread throughout Southern Africa, even occurring in Zimbabwe, Botswana, Namibia. Um, and males can reach a size of about 240 to 300 uh, millimeters or 30 centimeters. And exceptional, uh, exceptionally in, uh, individuals can weigh up to 1.4 kilograms. So this is really one of the largest frogs in Africa. In Central Africa, you've got the Goliath frog which grows slightly larger. But this is really an incredibly large frog. And they sort of, the hotspots or, or, or the, the, the area where they seem to be very prevalent is in the central parts of South Africa. But unfortunately, that area has had a lot of development taking place, agriculture, a lot of draining of the wetlands, and although they are not, um, according to the IUCN, listed as threatened, um, they have lost a lot of habitat and a lot of breeding habitat. Another giant in South Africa, as we've mentioned, is the crocodile, the Nile crocodile. And something I wanted to mention with the bullfrog as well, with most amphibian species, the females are larger, the exception there being the bullfrog. And the same with the crocodiles. A lot of reptiles, the females are larger, especially with the snakes, and that is to allow them to carry the, the eggs or the young. But in crocodiles, you also have a lot of uh, hierarchy with dominant males. And you have the same kind of thing with bullfrogs as well, where there's a lot of uh, territoriality. So with our crocodiles, the males tend to grow much larger than the females, and very large males could reach up to about six meters in length and exceed a thousand kilograms in weight. The females are usually half that size, usually about two and a half to three and a half meters, and you usually seldom exceed 400 to 450 kilograms. Another giant which we're very fortunate to have nesting on our northern KwaZulu Natal beaches is the leatherback turtle. For those of you who've had the opportunity to see a leatherback coming ashore to nest, it's the most incredible experience. And if you haven't ever seen a turtle coming up, I'd really advise you to try your best to go out to one of the turtle tours that are often arranged um, by permitted uh, service providers in Northern KwaZulu-Natal and get to see one of these animals coming out. You'll have a totally new outlook on almost a prehistoric um, presence, uh, watching this massive turtle haul itself out and lay her eggs. Unfortunately, our turtles are in serious trouble, and I'll, I'll elaborate a bit more on that in a moment. But the, the females can reach 1.5 to 1.7 meters in length with a weight of um, almost 1,000 kilograms. So uh, one of the larger females measured or weighed was 916 kilograms. And then in terms of our terrestrial tortoises, the big old uh, guy over here, the leopard tortoise, in the western, uh, sorry, the eastern Cape, they tend to grow a lot larger than elsewhere. Some of the large individuals reaching 60 to 70 centimeters with a weight of 40 kilograms. In our savannah areas and the Kruger National Park, they tend to be a bit smaller, usually um, 35 to 40 centimeters with a weight of around about 18 to 20 kilograms. And the giant among our lizards is this one over here, the Nile monitor lizard or the water monitor, or the, in Afrikaans known as the Vartelukavar. So the water monitor uh, can reach, adults can reach between 1.5 to about 2.5 meters in length. And occasionally those large individuals are mistaken for crocodiles 
understandably because of the large size. And very large individuals could almost weigh 50 kilograms, the weight of a bag of cement. And then in terms of our snakes, the giant in South Africa is the Southern African python. Uh, most individuals are about two and a half to three meters, but from time to time, and particularly historically, uh, some of these snakes would reach almost six meters in length with, with a weight of about 60 kilograms. So what threats are our amphibians and reptiles facing? They're numerous. They're coming from all directions. And individual frogs and reptiles or species are affected differently. They are different um, uh, stresses that are impacting on different species and different habitats. So this is kind of listed from what I believe are some of the, 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 the broad uh, serious impacts to the least serious impacts. But as I say, certain species, like when it comes to disease and parasites, there are certain frogs and amphibians that are taking more of a knock because of disease like chytrid fungus um, then uh, from urban development, for example. But of course, these are the impacts that they have to face. Urban development, and I usually consider that rapid. In other words, a bulldozer comes in, it, it just uh, plows up or, or grades the land. And within a week or two, you've got a housing development that has popped up in a shopping center, a strip mall, and uh, roads coming up. And that just destroys uh, just thousands and thousands and thousands of hectares of, of, of prime land every single year. Then habitat degradation and pollution, uh, sometimes a slightly slower progress, but just as destructive. And uh, pollution can include uh, chemical pollutants entering our wetlands and our water systems. Um, it can be physical pollution in the form of plastic. Agriculture, uh, monoculture, uh, forestry, also seriously detrimental to certain amphibian and reptile species. And it's a problem. It's a catch-22. We have to eat. We need to provide food for a growing population. Agriculture is important. Urban development is important. Housing is important. But how do we balance the destructive nature of these activities against conservation ideals? It's a major challenge. Of course, road mortality, um, the roads have, um, or the traffic on the roads have just increased tenfold in the last couple of years. And even late at night in our rural areas, there is a constant flow of traffic. And it's not only reptiles and, and amphibians that get run over, but a wide range of mammals, birds, invertebrates um, that get killed annually on our roads. Invasive alien species or alien invasive species, these include both animals and plants in terms of vegetation. Um, cats have been identified as a serious problem, uh, particularly around nature reserves where both domestic and feral cats uh, are known to kill large numbers of lizards, chameleons, small um, other reptiles. And invasive alien vegetation um, just transforms habitat. So if you've got a grassland area, and it gets overrun by Australian wattle, it changes the composition of that vegetation type. And what naturally occurs in that grassland area cannot survive in that infestation of wattle. So that's also a serious problem. We've also seen an uptake of frequent and unseasonal fires. Um, virtually every year up here in the high felt in uh, around Johannesburg, our grasslands just get burnt completely down. Um, invasive species are also highly flammable in the Cape Fynbos, and they lead to fires which are a lot more aggressive and a lot hotter. And we've had situations where several thousand angulate tortoises have been killed in fires in the Fynbos biome, and uh, the grass lizards, the Chemosaura, are taking quite a lot of strain because they often shelter in grass tussocks and when the fires come through, they simply can't get away. And uh, numerous uh, lizards are, are burnt in these fires. Climate change, we still don't know uh, to what extent climate is impacting on amphibians and reptiles, but it's bound to be quite profound. Um, some areas are becoming more arid. They're becoming hotter. Other areas are receiving more 
um, unseasonal rainfall, there's prolonged drought, and all of these have impacts, especially if you look at a critically endangered species like the table mountain ghost frog. Earlier, we were just talking about the lack of winter rainfall in the Western Cape. And if you have these streams on Table Mountain drying up for an extended period or over a couple of seasons, you've got the extinction of the Table Mountain ghost frog. If they've got no breeding habitat, no water, um, within a couple of seasons, you could lose a species quite easily. Um, some others that are adaptable to a warming climate, their ranges are expanding. So for a few species, a warmer climate may be more advantageous. And in some areas, you're going to get higher rainfall, and that may be advantageous to other frog species. But on the whole, climate change is having a serious impact. The unsustainable collection is also a factor, traditional healers in the pet trade, and of course, disease and parasites. But let's take a look at a couple of examples. A couple of years ago, I flew down to Cape Town from OR Tambo Airport in Johannesburg, and it was one of these absolutely incredibly clear um, uh, flights where there was not a cloud in the sky, uh, not too much of a haze. And I took the opportunity to just stare out the window, took a couple of photographs, and really get to appreciate the extent that we have actually impacted the landscape. Now, in this picture, you can see there the well-known dome, uh, previously known as the Coca-Cola Dome in, in, in Northgate, um, Ramburg area, surrounded by a lot of agriculture. Um, but as you go along, you can just see the rate of urban development, the thousands and thousands of townhouses that are going up. This, of course, um, you know, has other impacts on our daily lives as well, uh, most notably our load shedding. Um, we just got to provide so much more electricity to cater for the amount of um, uh, electrical needs in these houses. But as I said earlier, it's a catch-22. Um, we've got a housing shortage. We've got a growing population and we need to house people. So in some respects, having these small townhouse units are, are a way of creating that housing, but it really does have a detrimental impact. And there's very seldom the town plan is putting green corridors. You just see that these uh, developments are back on back on back, and there's no um, interleading corridors where species can at least disperse or, or move around. Um, even further um, in Central Africa, development, this is Kimberley. You can see Campus Dam up on the top right and the Kimberley Hole, the diamond mine in the center over there. But even on the outskirts of Kimberley, the rate of development is just never ending. And then, of course, in the Northern Cape, uh, near a river system, you've got large scale agriculture and we need to provide food. We also, it's important for South Africa's export market as well. Our agricultural sector. But again, it can have a really detrimental impact on reptile and amphibians and other species living in that habitat. This is as you're flying into Cape Town in the Western Cape. And yeah, you've got uh, fields of uh, 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 possibly vineyards, uh, wheat production, uh, citrus, and a few other crops. But this all used to be rhinosterfeld and other in indigenous fynbos vegetation types. And this was all previous habitat of one of our critically endangered species now, the geometric tortoise, which only survives in a few hand uh, 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 very small pockets of natural vegetation. And again, you can see there's just very little left of the natural vegetation. And the geometric tortoises in the background there, you can see some hills with a bit of indigenous vegetation but the geometric tortoises like the lowlands, the, the, the plains, and those are favorable, highly fertile fields for agricultural purposes. Invasive alien species, this is just outside of Cape Town as well. All those trees that you see at the bottom there is invasive wattle from Australia, combined with um, uh, destruction, sand mining, uh, it looks like it's taking place over there, so you have a combination of invasive species completely transforming whatever natural vegetation you've got there. And of course, um, uh, erosion, soil erosion and mining activities taking up habitat. And then again, urban development. 
Now, it's no surprise that the Western Cape is uh, well known for having several highly threatened species, which are now critically endangered and endangered. Uh, they include the, the table mountain ghost frog, the micro frog, and there are several other amphibians and reptiles um, just because of the sheer extent of development. Um, these uh, species have been pushed right to the fringe of very small pockets of habitat. And the problem with that is you also get these genetic bottlenecks because there's no ability for certain chameleons or amphibians to disperse to other populations because they're just surrounded by development. And uh, so genetically, you get a lot of um, um, uh, what we call a genetic bottleneck where the population is so small that you get things like inbreeding and that taking place. Now, this is from uh, a paper that was uh, published in 2013 in the Journal of Geomatics by Skuman and colleagues. And it's just a map taken over um, the last decade or so. And, and keeping in mind, this was 2013. We're now in, uh, almost nearing 2023. So it's, it's a, at least a decade old. But you can see the rate of impact that we've had in terms of um, cultivation in the brown areas, the green areas is forestry and plantations, yellow areas, urban. Um, and that's, so it's, it's quite profound how much we've changed South Africa's landscape. Pollution is a, seri a serious problem. Um, plastic pollution, we all know the problems associated with plastic running down from our river systems and our drainage systems and entering the coastal areas and uh, by extension, getting into the marine environment. Um, plastics obviously rely on petrochemicals for the production. And all indications are is that plastic production is going to increase exponentially over the next couple of decades. And this is Durban Harbor, a photograph taken by um, Dean Bossoff. And plastics, once they get into the ocean, are seriously detrimental to ocean and marine life. And particularly marine turtles. A lot of our turtles, uh, particularly the leatherback, they feed on jellyfish, and they often mistake plastic bags as a floating jellyfish. Uh, the smaller turtles that feed on corals and uh, anemones and uh, sea urchins, small bits of plastic also resemble those prey items floating in the water. And so they're accidentally ingested and it compacts inside of the gut or it obstructs the digestive tract and we're getting very high rates of mortality with our marine turtles because of plastic pollution. Harvesting, uh, the extent of the traditional uh, medicine trade, we don't really know the impact. We don't know how the species are collected, if they, you know, if, if people are going out and hunting or if they're picking up roadkill. But over here, this is in the Faraday Muti market in Johannesburg. And you can see a variety of reptiles um, in these bottles used for various medicinal regions, um, including in Fezi, which is the Isizulu word for the Mozambique spitting cobra, Ibululu, which is Pafada, and Imamba, which is the Mamba. And Mamba fetches quite a high price, but not as high as um, uh, Pafada's. Then, of course, um, you get a range of other products in these markets, and you can clearly see over there the pangolin skin hang up next to a black mamba skin, and there's a couple of other reptile skins interspersed with that. And this is a trade that we really need to get to understand. What are the, the uses? Is there a more sustainable way of harvesting? How can we cut down on utilizing these reptiles for traditional medicines? Are there better alternatives? And we've got a long road ahead in that game. And of course, the exotic pet trade. South Africa's unique reptiles are targeted by international smugglers. And the two groups that are highly sought after are usually the girdled lizards, like this one over here, the armadillo, armadillo girdled lizard from the, the, the West Coast. And um, they highly sought after in places like uh, Europe, Asia, particularly Japan, have, have a fetish um, in, in, in these girdled lizards. And of course, the dwarf adders, um, the small bitter species. Um, we've got several um, which are threatened and found in very small habitats, um, uh, um, horned adders, many horned adders, plain mountain adder, and a couple of others. 
and they are highly sought after and occasionally some of our tortoise species as well. Road mortality, as I mentioned earlier, is becoming quite a serious problem. As it warms up, when the rainy seasons come in, reptiles move around. Um, male snakes are on the move looking for females. They're looking for um, new habitat. They're out foraging and hunting. And with their sheer volume of traffic on the roads, a lot of them simply do not make it to the other side of the road. There you've got two angular tortoises in Port Elizabeth, uh, presumably a male and a female that were um, reproducing at the time, judging by the size and the close proximity, and both of them were killed by passing traffic. Right, but as I mentioned earlier, the impact of uh, human activities on the environment, it uh, impacts different species differently. There's a whole group, or, or I'd rather say a smaller group, of reptiles and amphibians that are more adaptable to our urban development and our landscape changes. And I call these the adaptables and the commensals. The commensals are the species that live in close proximity to, to people. And one of the species that have thrived in urban areas is the common dwarf gecko. Um, this is, is, is um, primarily a savanna species, but it's found across South Africa now, even in parts of Cape Town, the Eastern Cape, and the free state where traditionally they never occurred or historically they never occurred, they are now very common in our urban gardens. We've created ideal habitat for them. So they're one of the species that are thriving, as is the tropical house gecko, also very much a subtropical species from the savanna and the low felt. It is now very widespread and becoming increasingly common in urban homes in Johannesburg. Our roofing system, our lights that attract insects and moths and uh, termites and other insects to the house uh, favor these geckos. They nest inside roof cavities in the recesses in precast walls. So what was traditionally uh, savanna species living in rocky outcrops and on trees have now invaded our houses and are quite common. The other one, of course, is the speckled rock skink, extremely common in urban gardens, uh, particularly in Gauteng. And in some gardens, you can have upward of 30 to 40 individuals moving around the garden. We've created these ideal rockeries. And uh, despite you know, a lot of our insects over the decades seem to have vanished, but um, these species still uh, thrive in urban environments. The females at the moment yeah, in, in Johannesburg are currently giving birth, and they usually give live birth to between three to nine young at a time. So that's another highly adaptable and commensal species. In our peri-urban areas, of course, we do get certain snakes coming in, like the brown house snake. It got its name or derived its name because of its close association with houses and outbuildings, a totally harmless constrictor. But even some of our highly venomous snakes, like the black mamba, are thriving in peri-urban areas or suburban areas in KwaZulu-Natal. Um, the high rate of rats and mice and rodents in those areas have ensured that these uh, mambas are doing quite well. Certain amphibians are more adaptable than others. Some are very susceptible to uh, pollutants in the water and, and will rapidly uh, die out or, or, or leave the area. Others like the common river frog over here, you do find in a lot of urban areas um, in the eastern parts of South Africa. So, and some of the toads are also quite adaptable. But unfortunately, this is not the picture for a lot of our amphibians and reptiles that simply do not survive when we change the habitat or alter the environment. So taking a look now at, um, we've, we've covered the threats and uh, the impact that uh, humans are having on the environment. So let's take a look at a couple of examples and look at the species that are threatened. So within our frogs, we've got about 141 species in 12 different families. And unfortunately, a lot of them are either critically endangered or endangered. And among the critically endangered is the table mountain ghost frog, Rose's mountain toadlet, the rough moss frog, the northern moss frog, and the micro frog. What's unique about those critically endangered ones is that they all are from the Western Cape. 
and restricted to very small areas now because of uh, drainage of wetlands, uh, transformation of habitat, urban development, invasive alien species um, have all had an impact. So Cape Nature are, um, and the Endangered Wildlife Trust are monitoring these and putting interventive measures in place to, to ensure that um, they, you know, we can look after those species. Then, of course, the endangered ones, a lot of them from the Western Cape as well, the Cape Platana, uh, the Western Leopard Toad, nice and leaf folding frog. But Pickersgill's weed frog is from KwaZulu-Natal. Uh, there's a, a actual ex situ captive breeding program happening with the Pickersgill's weed frog in partnership with the Endangered Wildlife Trust. And they have been bred in, at the Johannesburg Zoo. And there are reintroduction programs happening in KwaZulu-Natal where um, habitat is, is, is being um, uh, rehabilitated and these frogs are being introduced. The long-toed treed frog is from the KwaZulu-Natal Midlands, as is the misbell chirping frog. Invasive alien plants are a threat to those species and also to the hogsback uh, kako. And then uh, the vulnerable one is the hogsback chirping frog from the hogsback mountains in the Eastern Cape. So we can see we've got quite a high uh, percentage of our amphibians or frogs are in these threatened categories. And then, of course, there are other categories where uh, species are listed as near threatened. In other words, they are becoming increasingly closer to getting up onto one of these higher IUCN listing or ratings. But now this is something that is quite fascinating. In our country, we are still finding new species or describing new species. Some of them may have been known for, for a couple of decades. Others were previously mistaken for another species, but through uh, um, uh, uh, genetic or molecular, molecular sequencing, they have been found to be quite unique as more studies have been uh, undertaken. We have uh, found and the relationships with the frogs, especially work that has been taking place in Angola of, of late and in the more northern parts, we've managed to, to get a clearer picture of the relationships or the taxonomy of our different frog species. But it's quite fascinating that right uh, post-2000, we have had numerous new species being described, um, including moss frogs from the Western Cape, um, the Kako, uh, Karoo Kako from uh, the, the Karoo areas. And very recently, we've had a couple of these little moss frogs from the Western Cape as well, um, described by a scientist from Cape Nature, Dr. Andrew Turner, um, Arthur Letella Draconella, and from the Kochelberg Mountains, Arthur Letella Kochelbergensis. Those were described in 2017. From KwaZulu-Natal, we've got um, Carruthers, a rain frog, Brev Breviceps carruthersi, and Passmore's rain frog, Breviceps passmori. Now, for those of you who are big into your frogs and amphibians, you will know that uh, Carruthers and Passmore are well-known authors of several field guides to South African frogs, um, Neville Passmore and Vincent Carruthers, um, those are the frogs named after. Um, another one from the Eastern Cape, a caco called Cacosternum thorini, um, from derived its name from Lord of the Rings. So some of our describers, uh, that one was described by Dr. Vanna Conradi from uh, Baywell, Port Elizabeth Museum. And uh, so some of them do get quite colorful names, but really quite fascinating. So the next couple of slides, I'm just going to go through a couple of examples of our frogs, just showing a bit of the diversity. Yeah, we've got an amplexant or mating pair of um, uh, casinas, bubbling casinas in Afrikaans known as the bottle flay pada. And somebody asked um, a question earlier as to the extent of pollution on our amphibian and the reproduction. And yes, it is having a very detrimental and catastrophic effect in many species, but not only in physically damaging or um, killing the, the individual frogs, but also to in their reproduction. Um, it, uh, the, it, it affects the hormonal system of the frogs. You get um, issues with embryonic development in the eggs. And sometimes in toxic or polluted water, the eggs will simply not develop. They'll simply become poisoned and they can die out. And of course, the health of the frog can deteriorate and uh, some species can then become more susceptible to parasites and diseases. 
um, and fungal diseases like the chytrid fungus. And that can be quite a serious problem for our amphibians as well. So water pollution and water quality is definitely um, one of the issues. In the savannah bushveld areas, uh, this is another very pretty frog that we've got, the banded rubber frog, the Chabanda rubberpada, Phrodomantis biofasciatus. This time of the year, as the rains are coming in, they'll be calling and they'll be um, reproducing at the moment. All of our frogs in South Africa, um, uh, well, in actual fact, most species across the world, fertilization is external. You have the male that will climb on top of the female in a, 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 a sort of holder in a system that we call amplexus. The female lays those eggs and the male deposits the sperm over the eggs externally once they have been laid and the eggs are fertilized that way. Um, there's, uh, to the best of our knowledge, there's no parthenogenic frogs, in other words, uh, females that reproduce spontaneously, that only occurs with some of the reptile species. So all frogs need uh, male and female um, to, to fertilize, or the male to fertilize the female eggs in terms of reproduction. The banded rubber frog is still relatively widespread and common across most parts of eastern South Africa and the low felt. The giant bullfrog or the Groot Brulpada, uh, Pixocephalus adspersus. As I said earlier, it's uh, not listed um, as a threatened species or endangered, but in certain regions it really should be, um, and particularly in Gauteng. Gauteng province was the hotspot for bullfrog populations. They um, were areas around Midrand, Halfway House, Kempton Park on East Rand, where thousands of individuals would congregate every couple of years when there was sufficient rainfall. They have a very particular requirement for shallow um, ephemeral or temporary pans. So you get the summer rainfall coming in. If you get enough rainfall, the pans fill up to a depth of maybe 8 to 12 or so centimetres. So it's a relatively shallow pan. And that is ideal for bullfrog breeding. And then you get this explosive um, uh, emergence of these adult bullfrogs. Now, they can remain sort of underground in a form of estivation or brumation over a period of months, even a couple of years, where they encase themselves in almost a watertight cocoon uh, through which they, they develop uh, uh, through a, a skin secretion when the pans dry out. So... They'll dig themselves the burrow into the soil. And then this protective casing prevents water loss over the, the um, winter period or very dry um, periods. And then when the rains come, the water absorbs into the ground. It will then break down this protective cocoon over the bullfrog and the bullfrogs dig themselves out of the mud. And they will go down to the nearest pan um, to breed. And the males are very protective. They are very territorial. They'll defend their territory and kind of jump forward with their mouth agape. Um, uh, they uh, call, uh, they, they get the name bullfrog because their call is a very low, uh, kind of like uh, sounding like a bull call. And they'll chase away rival males. So the competition can be quite fierce because the breeding is very quick as well. Um, and development within these frogs is very rapid, taking uh, a, a couple of weeks at the most. And that's because uh, when it's really hot in summer, these temporary pans can actually dry out quite quickly. So they've got a very short duration in which to breed. But in a lot of areas in Gauteng, we've built shopping malls over their former breeding habitat. We've drained a lot of wetlands. Uh, one of the pans that I used to monitor in Kempton Park um, it's just been completely surrounded. The actual pan of the water body is still there, but it's surrounded by townhouse development and that. And that's a problem because it uh, destroys all the foraging habitat. So naturally, once these bullfrogs are bred, they need to move around. They need to disperse and they need to find foraging areas in order to feed. But they are, they're coming up against brick walls, precast walls, townhouses, houses, and very high density traffic. So the moment the bullfrog tries to get across the road, there are just thousands of them that are killed. Fortunately for the species, it is still fairly widespread in Northwest Province, the Northern Cape, Botswana, and um, parts of Limpopo. 
um, and uh, in areas that are not seeing such rapid development. But certainly in terms of how Teng, this would really be threatened in a regional capacity. The painted reed frog, uh, very common across most of South Africa. It's uh, it scientifically has always been known as Hyperolius marmoratus, but recent genetic work um, has thrown it into the um, Hyperolius viridiflavus species complex. Now this uh, is, is very widespread. The diversity and the color pattern of these frogs is incredible. Um, they occur right from uh, parts of the Eastern Cape throughout KwaZulu-Natal, the low felt, the savannah areas, and right up into East Africa and Central Africa. Um, numerous subspecies have been described. The greater leaf folding frog, Afrixilis fornicinii, also found in the low felt and the KwaZulu Natal areas. Um, still relatively common in abundance, so it's not one of the threatened species. But here is one of the endangered ones uh, the Kluwer frog from KwaZulu Natal. Mostly confined to the coastal areas where they prefer these well wooded uh, or well vegetated streams, but they are susceptible to um, invasive alien plants, especially the blue gums or the eucalypts that take up a lot of water. Um, also, to the leaves um, from gum trees and that that fall into the water, it, it tends to taint the water. Um, gum trees or eucalypts have a lot of oil residue and that can change the water quality, which can impact on the frogs, but also to just general degradation of the habitat has led to this particular species becoming threatened. And uh, there's a couple of individuals. Uh, I think these are all males uh, getting ready or looking for a female in Gillette's in KwaZulu-Natal. And the females lay their eggs on the underside of leaves, or on the top of the base of leaves, on broad leaves and that. And you can see the young tadpoles developing within these gelatinous capsules. And eventually what will happen when they reach a certain stage, they will break out of these capsules and fall into the water below. And it's important that, you know, there's sufficient water that it hasn't dried up and that the water is of a decent quality so that these tadpoles can complete the development. But as I said, due to habitat loss and degradation, they're becoming increasingly rare. Jumping onto our Chelonians, the tortoises, terrapins, and the turtles. In terms of our terrestrial land tortoises, South Africa has the highest diversity of species than anywhere else in the world. So we really do have a responsibility to look after them. The marine species, the marine turtles, of which we have five species that uh, occur in South African waters, and two of them, the, the loggerhead and the leatherback, come ashore to breed, um, all of them are threatened in different categories. Um, critically endangered is the hawksbill turtle, and then endangered the green turtle, the leatherback turtle, and in the vulnerable category, the loggerhead turtle and olive ridley turtle. And as I mentioned, ocean plastic or plastic getting into the ocean, one of the serious uh, threats. But also to overexploitation in many areas, when the females come ashore to breed, the eggs are harvested by the human population um, for protein. And therefore, you can have uh, thousands of nests that are destroyed. But um, they are um, increasingly across the globe. Uh, more and more countries are becoming more protective of their marine turtles but uh, still their populations are, are critical. And even the, the leatherback turtle, I think is probably gonna be um, upgraded to critically endangered if it hasn't already been. I haven't seen the, the latest IUC in classification, but their populations are dwindling rapidly. And then uh, in the Western Cape, I mentioned earlier, the transformation of the Rhinosterfeld. Away, which was former habitat of the geometric tortoise, and that's why that one is now uh, critically endangered. And then the, there are two species of dwarf tortoise in Afrikaans known as the patluopus um, in the Karoo, the Karoo dwarf tortoise and the speckled dwarf tortoise. Um, their populations are crashing dramatically as a result of climate change, uh, more aridification in that area, a less frequent rainfall has become a problem, but also to the road network, um, increased predation from ravens and crows have had an impact and just general degradation of the environment in which they occur. 
So they are becoming increasingly rare and uh, at least one species may be uplisted to critically endangered as well. There we've got an example of a green turtle. I think there's one or two records of green turtles nesting in South Africa, but the majority of them nest further north in Mozambique and some of the offshore islands and in Madagascar. Um, it's mostly the leatherback and the loggerhead that are the regular nesters in northern KwaZulu-Natal. There's a young loggerhead turtle. As they mature, the shell becomes less uh, profiled. Over here, you can see the shell is still quite uh, bumpy. Um, and that is one of the species that does breed regularly. And uh, of concern, we've noticed in the last uh, couple of years, there's more of these young turtles washing up on South African beaches, and they seem to be in quite a poor state of health. Um, some of them have gone into rehabilitation facilities and some of the aquariums to try and get them back up to, to, to health, but uh, it, it's a very expensive exercise to try and keep turtles in captivity. And um, that may be a result of plastic ingestion or just um, other pollutants in the ocean that is driving these turtles um, and, and creating them or leading them to become more. There we've got our leopard tortoise, which we saw earlier. Um, this is still a fairly widespread species, but unfortunately hundreds are picked up every year uh, by people that want to keep them in their garden or bring them home as a pet. And this brings all sorts of problems for, for conservation authorities because uh, very often they don't know where the tortoise originated from. So trying to rehabilitate, reintroduce a tortoise is not practical as you could uh, cause genetic contamination of the local populations or you could introduce unique parasites and diseases into an existing population. So tortoises are always best left where they're found. The southern marsh terrapin is still very widespread in the southern and eastern parts of the country. And our Nile crocodile, this is a species that historically was highly exploited for their skins, particularly the underbelly. But commercial breeding enterprises that took uh, place in the early 1960s and 70s and was later refined in the 80s and the 90s ensured that there was no more need for people to go out into the wild to hunt crocodiles. Um, but unfortunately, they are taking another hit, um, man-induced as well, most notably pollution or chemical pollutants. Even in the Kruger National Park, the crocodiles are not safe in that haven or refuge for wildlife because you have a lot of east-flowing rivers that are coming down from highly industrial and urbanized areas Carrying with, a, carrying with that water a wide range of chemicals, soaps, and other chemical constituents and pollutants in that water. And it's been found that what's happening with a lot of the females when they lay the eggs, the calcification of the eggs are often very weak and brittle. So the eggshell is not forming properly. Um, there's hormonal problems happening. And just uh, general toxicity levels are increasing. And one of the, the, the toxic uh, uh, chemicals or, or metals, heavy metals that have been found in crocodiles as well is increase in lead. So, and, and uh, lead poisoning leads to um, uh, problems with the bone structure and other sort of physiological impacts on these crocodiles. So that is a huge concern because you can protect species within a fenced area but you can't stop the water flow that's coming in and you can't purify the water as it comes into places like the Kruger National Park. So our crocodile populations are certainly not out of the woods yet. In terms of our lizards, we've got an incredible diversity, 272 species in nine different families. Unfortunately, we may have lost two of them. They haven't been seen in many, many decades. Uh, one of them, Eastwood's long-tailed seps, is presumed extinct. It used to occur in the Woodbush area um, uh, alongside the Falkberg in Limpopo province. And despite numerous dedicated searches for that lizard, it has not been seen in, a, I think, about 60 or 70 years. The other one in Durban, Gunther's dwarf burrowing skink, has also... Um, not been found in, in many decades, and uh, both are classified as extinct. 
Also in the Durban area, surviving in small little pockets of parklands and uh, stairwells and pavements, and that is the critically endangered Durban dwarf burrowing skink. So we have a couple of uh, seriously threatened lizards. In terms of the endangered species, we've got a flat lizard from Limpopo, a couple of the dwarf chameleons as well, um, highly threatened, and several vulnerable species, including some of the, the, the girdled lizards like the sun gazer, um, in the central parts of the Free State because of agriculture, a couple of the, the long-tailed sets as well, um, the tetradactylus, uh, following the similar plight as Eastwood's long-tailed sets, they don't seem to adapt well to changing habitats. But like our frogs, we've had numerous species described in the last couple of years, um, a couple of thick-toed geckos, most notably the Afroeduras or the Afroduras, which are the flat geckos, a lot of them described from work that was done by Dr. Niels Jacobson, who used to work for the former Transvaal Division of Nature Conservation as a, a senior scientist and herpetologist. Um, so some of these go, uh, were known as unique species way back in the late 1980s and early 1990s, but only recently through genetic sequencing, they were described as unique species. Um, also, two a uh, couple of Hochia geckos um, from the Western Cape. And uh, right now, in 2022, we've had three species of dwarf chameleons from the Western Cape uh, that have been described by Dr. Crystal Tolley from Sandby and colleagues. And these have also been known for, for many years, but they've just actually formally been um, described um, in 2022. So that's quite fascinating that we're still having these species being described. A uh, quick run through some of our um, lizards, just showing you the diversity. I haven't got too many slides over here because of time constraints, but yeah, Kip, uh, Cape thick-toed gecko, the Pachydactylus. It's a, quite a, a, a broad genus. There, there are numerous species in South Africa. And like some of our scorpions, they are all adapted to very unique geology and soil types. Some are rock living. They prefer rocky habitats. Some are uh, more... Uh, inclined to live in sandy areas, but the different geology has shaped the distribution of these different species in South Africa. Then uh, this is Van Damme's dragon lizard that lives in this unique habitat from the northeastern parts of Gauteng and goes along the Olifants River system um, right the way into the Kruger National Park. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the dragon lizards or the girdled lizards are often poached by um, poachers because of the pet trade and trying to smuggle them overseas because they are very unique looking lizards. A lot of them live in these very unique landscapes in these rocky crevices. And the sun gazer lizard, which is very similar, lives in um, open grassland areas. They burrow into the soil. Uh, but a lot of that habitat has been taken up by sunflower and maize production. And then we even have lizards that look like canaries or a mix between a canary and a duck, like this thin-tailed legless skink. Again, our skink diversity in uh, South Africa and Afrikaans, the skinks are referred to as khlada akadis, um, or very wide diversity. A couple of them are threatened, but a lot of them are some of our most common reptiles that we encounter. Yeah, we've got Walberg snake eyed skink. Uh, many of the lizards have eyelids, and so when you approach them, they usually blink. But the snake eyed skink is so called because it doesn't have that eyelid covering. So it's just got that um, eye without the covering. Variable skink, very common across most parts of um, eastern South Africa from the Natal lowlands into the savannah bio. And then this is habitat, a uh, very threatened habitat in uh, many areas of Gauteng where you've got uh, pretty much intact grassland areas and a lot of reptiles, amphibians and frogs that you find in these grasslands, one of them being this uh, beautiful lizard, the Delalandi sandfelt lizard. But unlike some of our skinks and the geckos that do adapt to urban areas, this species simply does not adapt. Um, once this grassland is gone, so too is the lizard. It simply can't survive. Um, and with the amount of urban development, uh, this is why it's still fairly widespread in the KwaZulu-Natal area and the eastern escarpment of Mpumalanga, uh, going into Swaziland or Iswatini. 
but it is um, losing a lot of habitat. Our white-throated monitor lizard, we have two species of uh, monitor lizards in Afrikaans known as the Lukavana, uh, this one over here, the felt Lukavan, or the white-throated monitor lizard, and of course, the water monitor lizard. They're two of our largest species of lizards. And as I mentioned earlier, in some areas, the water monitor populations are declining quite rapidly. Here we've got a southern tree agama, uh, one of uh, several agama species. This is uh, the one that you, is quite widespread in the savannah biome. And at the beginning of the breeding season, which is around about now, September, October, the males take on a brilliant bluish green tinge. So the back becomes this bright turquoise green and the head this electric blue color. And the females are more of a drab color because they're carrying the eggs, so they need to rely on cryptic coloration to avoid predation. Um, but the males, um, and often with uh, birds of prey, uh, with like falcons and the other small birds of prey that feed on lizards, you often find that when they do uh, grab an agama, it's often a male because they are so easily seen during the breeding season when they show these vivid markings. And the good old uh, flat-necked chameleon, very widespread across Eastern South Africa, but this is a species that is really getting hammered on our roads. There are just several thousand getting squashed every single year on our road systems as they're crossing over the roads. You'll know that chameleons are not uh, renowned for their speed. And when they get on the road, they've got this slow jerking movement that they move across and they no match for a car coming down at 120 kilometers an hour. Um, they also are having an impact in urban areas because of herbicides and pesticide use. Uh, uh, feral and domestic cats are having an impact on populations. And sometimes in some areas, they're just persecuted. Um, there's a lot of fear with uh, some people that, that think that a chameleon coming into the house or the yard um, is a bad omen. Uh, so a lot of them are killed on site as well. Earlier, I mentioned the three new dwarf chameleons that were described from the Western Cape, but this is just an example of the diversity that you find in places like KwaZulu-Natal, where the brown uh, spots are the distribution of the KwaZulu dwarf chameleon, or what was known as the black-headed dwarf chameleon. The yellow is the uh, distribution of the Midlands dwarf chameleon, which is now considered to be um, endangered. Uh, the Midlands dwarf chameleon and the KwaZulu dwarf chameleon are very closely related. And then there's a couple of very unique chameleons, uh, Ngomi uh, dwarf chameleon, uh, Zululand dwarf chameleon, Sotaros dwarf chameleon, which are found in isolated forested areas in KwaZulu-Natal. Um, these ones that are found in these uh, fragmented forested areas are threatened because if that forest environment is uh, destroyed either through uh, human activities such as uh, forestry practices or um, development or climate change, um, these dwarf chameleons could become uh, critically endangered in a very short space of time. Uh, that's the endangered Midlands dwarf chameleon, Bradipodium and Thamnobates. Uh, you find them around places like Howick, Nottingham Road, and other towns in the Midlands. They are adaptable to urban gardens um, however, um, the use of herbicides and pesticides could have an impact on them. And this is a very pretty male in his breeding display or his breeding coat of the Ngome dwarf chameleon found in Ngome forest of northern KwaZulu-Natal. And then lastly, to wrap up this evening, a quick look at some of our snakes. Um, 132 different species in 14 families. Uh, fortunately, our snakes don't seem to be taking as much strain as our frogs and the lizards, but we still need to do a lot of research. And this is where my research is taking me, is looking at the impact of um, habitat modification and change on our snake populations, in addition to climate change. Um, that is the topic of my uh, PhD, which I'm about to embark on. Um, so I'll be looking at that. But currently we have the Albany adder, and the Plain Mountain Adder that are listed as endangered. The Albany Adder is in an area just outside of Port Elizabeth, which is zoned for a lot of industrial development. Uh, but recently there's been a few more populations found in certain protected areas. So hopefully 
Um, they may be downlisted, but we're not too sure at the moment. And then the Namakwa dwarf adder is found in the West Coast, in the area that is highly sought after for diamond mining um, in Namakwa land. So their habitat is uh, quite threatened. And a quick look at a few of the snake examples. We have some bizarre creatures like this uh, beaked blind snake. Uh, we've also got the, the threat snakes, which are uh, fossorial. They are burrowing snakes. You can see the very smooth polished scales allow them to move underground. And most of them feed on termites and termite lava. Then, of course, the Southern African python. Um, this is listed as a top species um, with uh, the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment. In other words, it's one of the threatened species. But according to the IUCN classification, it is not listed in a threatened category. Um, but they are highly utilized, um, particularly in the traditional uh, uh, traditional multi markets. Uh, both the fat and the skin is sought after, but they're also generally persecuted. Um, in agricultural rural areas, they are often feared that they're going to feed on, on goats and other livestock and are needless killed. And, um, you know, sometimes they're also poached and you have people displaying them, wanting to keep them as pets. Um, so that's the Southern African python, a very beautiful snake. A non-venomous, it's a constrictor, and a really, um, it, it's it's a very beneficial snake in terms of controlling rodent populations. The beautiful aurora snake, still very widespread across from the Western Cape through the Eastern Cape and our grasslands of the interior and uh, the KwaZulu-Natal Midlands, but also to the rate of um, uh, destruction happening, they, they don't seem to be as adaptable as the brown house snake, so they're becoming increasingly rare, but a, a really a very gentle, harmless snake. Brown water snake, we've got uh, currently three species of water snakes in South Africa. The common or the brown water snake is obviously the most widespread, but these are very important snakes in terms of monitoring water quality. Most of them feed on amphibians and frogs. So if there's a drop in the frog population, it's gonna impact on the water snakes. And also to the water quality, um, they generally prefer areas that have got a relatively high or good water quality. If the water is too polluted, you tend to find that the water snakes won't occur there. So they're a good flagship species for monitoring. Beautiful little Cape wolf snake, a small species uh, that feeds primarily on lizards and geckos, and often mistaken for this venomous uh, one, the, the stiletto snake, or in Afrikaans called the sapex slum. Um, a lot of people mistake them for a harmless wolf snake and uh, freely handle them. And they have these uh, highly mobile fans just below the eyes, which if you try to hold them behind the head, they can swivel those fans out the side of the mouth and insert them into your thumb or your finger. They've got a cytotoxic venom, and bites are extremely painful. Um, it causes pain and swelling and tissue damage and necrosis. So always good to make sure that if you're gonna pick up a snake that you're not sure what it is, um, just rather don't freely handle it um, because every year we just get dozens of bites from stiletto snakes. Uh, they've not yet proved to be fatal, but some people do have quite serious uh, complications and deformities of their digits or their limbs after being bitten by one of these snakes. One of our green snakes, the, the spotted bush snake or the gespickled boslung, quite common in the low felt in KwaZulu-Natal. And then a handful of highly venomous snakes that uh, contribute to snake bites in Southern Africa, uh, including this one over here, the snouted cobra or the vipneus cobra, uh, relatively common in the savannah and bushveld areas. The green mamba or the eastern green mamba is restricted to coastal KwaZulu-Natal. And this is one that we are currently watching very closely in terms of monitoring. It's not yet listed in a threatened category. So in other words, it's not listed as endangered or uh, vulnerable. Um, but there's uh, enough justification that it should be because a lot of the habitat along KwaZulu-Natal has become very fragmented. They are found in natural vegetation, sort of 
uh, dense thickets, uh, forest areas. And so where you have uh, large tracts of urban development, uh, although they do come into urban areas, especially where there are trees, we're not quite sure at what rate they're dispersing. Uh, genetically, they seem to be distinct from the green mambas that you find further up in Mozambique and East Africa, but there's more research needed for that. So the KwaZulu-Natal green mamba may in actual fact be um, a species in need of conservation uh, uh, you know, priority um, because of lack uh, or loss of habitat. And also too, it may prove to be quite a unique species to South Africa. And then uh, I had to put in a slide because you can't do a talk on snakes or reptiles or uh, herpetology without inserting an uh, image of the notorious black mamba. And as I mentioned earlier, it's quite interesting. This is a widespread uh, snake found in uh, a very far northern Gauteng, parts of northwest province in the savannah. So you'll find them in reserves like Pilonsburg, Madikwe, and then, of course, Limpopo province, and uh, very common and widespread throughout the Low Felt and places like the Kruger National Park. And then throughout most of the lowland, uh, low lying areas of KwaZulu Natal. There's a couple of guys doing research in KwaZulu Natal at the moment, um, affiliated with the University of KwaZulu Natal, where they're looking at the human wildlife uh, sort of conflict. And what is quite remarkable about black mambas is that in some of the urban areas around Durban, they're still relatively common. And they seem to be thriving in some of these areas, uh, feeding on the rats and the mice. But what is probably more remarkable is it was without a doubt one of South Africa's most highly venomous snakes. They've got a deadly neurotoxin. It uh, is absorbed rapidly in the human body, uh, very quickly leading to respiratory failure and impacts on the nervous system. But yet, despite them being so common in a highly uh, populated area of KwaZulu-Natal, snake bite from black mambas is incredibly rare. And it just goes to show that this snake has got an undeserved reputation for being aggressive and being a cold-blooded murderer. Um, they, in actual fact, live in very close proximity to people, but yet bites are exceedingly rare. So although it is a very fast and alert and highly strong snake, um, they are not that inclined to bite. And uh, recently on YouTube, there was somebody handling a black mamba and he kept waving his hand right in front of the mamba. Um, I'm not going to uh, mention who it was or, or what it was, but I'm sure if you, you do an online search, you can find that video. And that mamba, in all that time of being harassed, um, it was opening its mouth and it was uh, uh, showing its threat display, but despite that provocation, it still didn't bite. Um, but nonetheless, certainly a snake to uh, treat with respect. And then lastly, the adders and the vipers. Uh, this is very well known throughout most of South Africa, the good old puff adder, and um, relatively widespread, but my word, the, the number of individuals that are killed on the roads every year in, in, with road traffic is, is quite alarming, especially the males, which are very active as they go out searching for females. But to the large degree, a lot of the adders and the vipers have a sedentary lifestyle where they just stick to one area. And a very good example of that is the Gaboon Adder, which is found in northern KwaZulu-Natal from around about Umtumzini, the Umlalazi Nature Reserve area, and then further up uh, past St. Lucia and into parts of Mozambique. You also find Gaboon Adders in uh, uh, places like Zambia, Angola, Malawi, the Democratic Republic of Congo. So it's a fairly widespread snake. In South Africa, around St. Lucia, there's been a lot of development or, or uh, destruction of the former forest habitat. And so the species is regionally threatened. Um, they, they've become quite rare um, in, in some parts of KwaZulu-Natal. Uh, an incredible snake, uh, one of the largest of our added species. And also, despite their, their size, they're not that inclined to bite as well. They, they, they're fairly placid snakes. 
And then lastly, this one over here is one of threatened adders, a very small dwarf adder. And as I mentioned earlier, a lot of these are highly sought after by the exotic pet trade to be smuggled um, internationally. Um, this one, the Plain Mountain Adder, which is found in a few isolated mountain ranges in the Eastern Cape. Um, not to be mistaken for the more widespread common berg adder or the Cape berg adder, which you also find in the KwaZulu-Natal Drakensberg and the Mpumalanga and Mpopo escarpment. Right, so ladies and gentlemen, um, that is an overview of where we are at at the moment. We are still learning an incredible amount about our diversity of the reptiles and amphibians and uh, the conservation status is constantly being reviewed. Um, currently, the, the Atlas and Red Data Book for reptiles is, um, has recently been reviewed, and I think it's going to be published in digital format uh, shortly. I need to find out from Sanby when that will be. So the threat status of some of our reptiles um, that I've shown tonight may have actually changed when the new edition comes out. Um, but I hope you've got some sense as to the, the, the challenges that we're facing in terms of conservation, even in our protected areas with road mortality, with pollution. Um, and uh, the next time you're out there, out and about in the field, you would have a better appreciation for the diversity of amphibians and reptiles that we have in our country. So on that note, I'd like to thank everybody for participating this evening. And I'll hand it back over to the panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you very much um, for, for that um, really interesting talk. So from, from us at the Honorary Rangers and to everybody who joined us this evening, thank you very much.